Hey there everyone, welcome back to Utility Sports. Really excited for this video as we're gonna discuss my guys in the 2023 NBA draft class. And no, this is not necessarily my big board. That will be dropping this week. I've been working extremely hard on putting the finishing touches on that. We will have a video up on the channel, which I'm really excited for as well. So make sure to stay tuned for that. And if you do overall enjoy the content you see here, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, hit that notification bell as it's draft week. So there's gonna be a lot of great content coming out. And this video specifically is more so focused on who my favorite players are in the draft. And it doesn't necessarily mean the best players. Now I'm gonna say that there are four players in this that are projected top 10 picks. And yes, that is a decent number. I just really enjoy watching those specific players play for a few reasons, which we'll get into in this video. But it's more so about just as a basketball person, as a guy who really enjoys basketball, what players are really fun for me? Which prospects do I enjoy watching the most? So I hope you guys do enjoy this video and I would also really love to hear down in the comment section who your guys are in this 2023 class. And no, again, it doesn't have to be your big board or who you think is gonna end up being the best. It's just about who do you like to watch? Who do you really enjoy? And so I'm definitely looking forward to hearing from you guys who maybe your top seven, eight, nine, ten 10 guys to watch are in this class from a pure enjoyment perspective so without further ado let's jump into my number one player that i enjoy to watch and that's amen thompson from the city reapers of the overtime elite now this isn't in any specific order so just because he's my guy number one doesn't mean that he's my favorite necessarily these are just kind of loosely compiled players that i enjoy but Amon Thompson would definitely be toward the top if I had to rank it because of a few reasons. First of all, I myself really enjoy players who have really good feel and, and passing vision and can make quick, snappy decisions and reads, especially as a downhill kind of force. And I think Amon Thompson perf perfectly embodies a lot of those traits. He's just a really good downhill facilitator uh, and a player that really flashes as kind of a lob passer, makes a lot of nice dump off passes as well, utilizes his size in a very functional way that most guards don't have the ability to do just because he is significantly bigger than a lot of other guards. And I think kind of that sized positionless playmaking is something that I always enjoy watching. An example of that, I liked watching Denny Avdia quite a bit back when he was playing for Maccabi Tel Aviv in his own draft class. So I just kind of have like a, a special place in my heart, but then also as kind of a finisher, I think Amon Thompson, just like from a prospect evaluation standpoint, he's been so fun for me this year uh, because he's just so different than a lot of other prospects we've ever seen because yes, he has that downhill, like fast quickness that really doesn't get seen very frequently. But in addition to that, he's just somebody who can change direction with the best of them. He's a really special player in that regard. And I really do enjoy watching him play with his ability to kind of flip his hips, change direction off of a live dribble. He's super electric. That's really the best word to use to describe him uh, and his game. And I think Amon Thompson, when I just talk about players I like watching, I think he's one of those headliners. Uh, of course, you know, the highlight reel is incredible, but I think just his understanding of the game, I think is very undersold currently. I think he has a lot of great feel uh, and he's just a player that I enjoy watching and I really hope that jump shot comes along because if it does, he's gonna be a, a fantastic pickup for an NBA roster, and I'm really looking forward to see where he goes on Thursday. Moving on to my second guy here, and that is Taylor Hendricks of the UCF Knights. And I think Taylor Hendricks uh, is a player who, yes, another projected top 10 pick, but overall just a player I really like watching for quite a few different reasons than Amon Thompson. A lot of the things I highlighted about Amon Thompson aren't necessarily true about Hendricks. He doesn't have the craziest side-to-side -side mobility. He's not this flashy facilitator, but I think one thing I really love is positional rim protection and just versatility on the defensive end of the floor with sheer size and willingness to kind of stick in there, risk being postered and still coming out on the better side of things. I think Taylor Hendricks does that more than any college prospect arguably in this year's draft. Now there's another prospect we'll talk about later on who does that as well 
in the college game. And then there was also a, a guy overseas, I think you guys know who I'm referencing, who's a fantastic shot blocker. But Taylor Hendricks, to me, I mean, just so fun to watch defensively because he has some of those incredible highlights that when you're watching, you're just like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that that just happened. And I think he is a really special player and a guy who, uh, in most situations, probably would... Uh, be valued significantly higher than he is in this class just because there's so much talent and then also I just feel very confident in him as kind of a fit part of this too is kind of how comfortable I feel with them as players how kind of I would want to build a team and I think Taylor Hendricks is like a four is the perfect iteration of what you're looking for in today's NBA if it's not an all NBA caliber power forward you're looking for a player who like say an Aaron Gordon for the Denver Nuggets, who I think Taylor Hendricks maybe has some better qualities even than Aaron Gordon, some that he's worse at for sure as well, but a kind of versatile defender who can guard out on the perimeter, can protect the rim a bit, extremely athletic, a functional cutter, dunker spot sitter, and then of course can knock down open shots. Hendricks is significantly better at that as well, shot over 39% from three this past year for UCF, and I think all in all, Taylor Hendricks is a special prospect uh, and a really talented player that I don't know if he's gotten enough love for kind of how unique of an athlete he is. Uh, just finishing around the rim, there's some really impressive finishes, kind of as a, a standing dunk guy, which is really fun to watch as well. When a guy, you think he's just down there with like two or three guys on him and he's kind of overmatched and outmatched. And then all of a sudden he just rises up and throws it down on two or three dudes. Uh, it's just a lot of fun to watch. And one of the reasons I really do love Taylor Hendricks in this draft. My third guy, Anthony Black, from the Arkansas Razorbacks. And I think Anthony Black's one of those really polarizing prospects because some of the people that aren't even high on him acknowledge how good of an overall player he is, but there are some concerns, of course, about the shot making and is he a true offensive engine? But for me, when I go back to kind of what we talked about Amon Thompson, that positionless, sizey playmaking always has the sweet spot in my heart. I've always just loved passing, and I think Anthony Black is one of the more anticipatory passers in this year's draft, he throws incredibly tight window passes, and oftentimes to, to the point where his teammates aren't even ready for them. And I think his season in Arkansas probably helped him advance in that skill set as well, because that team just did not shoot the three ball very well. Anthony Black himself only shot 30%, but the team didn't shoot much better around him at a 31.3% clip holistically as a team. So. Anthony Black to me is a player who I think in NBA spacing is going to thrive even more. And I just really like watching him because not only does he have that kind of playmaking feel, uh, he can also operate in a pick and roll, has pretty good understanding of when to get off the basketball and when to not get off of it. Something I think is a really important trait and skill set for a guard. And with that size, I think he's a really good functional defender, both at the point of attack when he's tasked with guarding the basketball itself, but also kind of as a pinch guy in driving lanes. Something I think is a really underrated trait. I haven't heard a lot of people talking about it, but even when I was watching his high school film a year ago, two years ago, one of the first things that stood out to me was, wow, this guy is really big for his position and he is a really good defensive playmaker. He just gets his hands on the basketball, averaged over two steals a game this past year for Arkansas. And I think Anthony Black's a player who's going to be a really, really good watch in the NBA because with the right spacing, with the right unit of guys around him, I think, you know, maybe he's not the biggest ceiling raiser, but I think he's going to be a hell of a floor raiser. And I think that's going to be really good for a lot of teams. I think he's going to have a lot of really great NBA seasons where he's a super impactful winner. And that's something I always enjoy watching. Moving on to my fourth guy here now, and this is a player who you know, I love and I, I'm starting to see a little bit more buzz around him as well. Now he's a quite a bit older prospect, but it's Trace Jackson Davis from Indiana. And I just adore this guy as an overall prospect. I think realistically, when you talk about some of the bigs in this class, there's an argument, I think when it's all said and done, that he could end up being really the second best to center in this year's draft behind Victor Wembanyama, which I know sounds a little crazy right now because there's a lot of love for other center prospects and some of these guys have better physicals, they're taller, bigger wingspans than Trace Jackson Davis. But at the end of the day, this guy really just knows how to play basketball. And I think on day one of his career with his age, 
I think my draft logic and draft theory has changed over the last couple of years of, hey, drafting a 22, 23 year old prospect, I know it doesn't sound great because you're thinking, oh, well, the potential, you know, this guy's so much more experienced, he should be better. What's the long term upside? The reality is, if you're a team picking between picks 20 and 30, a first round selection that's non lottery and you have a playoff talent and playoff core around this player, you're getting this player for not only the rookie deal, which will be toward the prime of their career, I think 23 through 28, very good prime years and, and kind of the beginning of the prime in that stretch and just a, kind of an NBA ready insert to your roster, which is really good on an affordable deal. But then even after that, their restricted free agency status years, when they go in and sign a probably relatively cheap contract, not crazy amount of money, you're tying yourself to a player through his entire prime for a relatively affordable deal. He's an NBA ready investment. You're thinking about a guy who can step in and, and help you win right away. And that's what Trace Jackson Davis does. He's one of the best passing big men we've seen in a long time. Now at Indiana, they used him a lot out of the low post. And I think that's something that's going to help him translate into the NBA a little bit because he knows how to get a bucket down there. I wouldn't expect him to do it frequently in the NBA, but I think what he can do, and if he goes to the right situation with a coach that knows how to utilize his game, he could be a fantastic post passer. I think that there's other things he can do as well, like operating out of the short roll. We haven't seen him do that a ton for Indiana, but as a decision maker, he's capable, but he's also a skilled enough finisher, both below and above the rim to do a lot of different things for you, kind of as an off ball rim running center, which is a little bit different again than what he did at Indiana. But I think defensively too, yes, I know people like to talk about, oh, well, he's not the biggest center in the class and, and by no means is he, but he's such just a, a good, smart player. And he's got really great athleticism for the position. He flips his hips extremely well. This isn't a comparison here, but think Bam Adebayo-esque when it comes to the defensive side of the floor. Yes, Bam has some limitations because of his size, but he also is just more wing sized, which means he moves a little bit more like a wing. And I would say Trace Jackson Davis falls in a similar category. Now, I don't think he's Bam Adebayo. I don't think he's gonna be quite that good of a, pro uh, of a player, but I do think that there is a lot of good NBA functionality. And if you told me that Trace Jackson Davis is like a day one starter somewhere, I would believe it. He would start right now for the Dallas Mavericks for sure. No questions asked. I think he's a significantly better Dwight Powell. And I think he's gonna be a player who ends up working very, very well in the NBA. Moving on now to my fifth guy. And that is somebody who I was not expecting to fall in love with in this draft process. And that is Leonard Miller from the G League Ignite program. And a year ago, I actually made a video on the channel and I couldn't help but almost laugh about who he was as a prospect at that point because he was a little bit smaller than where he currently is. He's grown a bit since. And he was kind of utilized in prep school as a point forward, point guard type, where he had the ball in his hands a lot and it led to a lot of careless turnovers and just really bad production. And, and just, it wasn't pretty to watch. Flash forward to today, and you're looking at a massive human being at about six nine and a quarter with without shoes. So he's going to play around six foot eleven as a power forward. And I think just realistically, with that kind of experience he has, if you kind of lower his role, scale him down a bit, you're going to actually get a player who can play with some feel, with really good size. You can utilize him in high lows. You can utilize him as a transition tempo pusher. I think that occasionally, maybe you have him run a set or two for you. I would be careful putting him in those roles frequently, but really the big thing about Leonard Miller is his work that he's put in. And it's not just his development, but it's his willingness to actually kind of bang down low, work on the glass. He leverages his new found frame and size extremely well. And I think he's just an overall incredible prospect and a player who once you guys see my big board, you're gonna be maybe a little surprised with how high I have Leonard Miller. I just think that he has really good functionality. And I'm gonna say it right here, a little bit of a spoiler for a potential video that might come out this week as well with draft comparisons. Leonard Miller is a little bit of the basketball love child between Lamar Odom and Bobby Portis with the rebounding, the left-handedness from Lamar Odom, the ability to push and transition, make some flashy passes. He's just an all around really fun player. And I, I just see shades of both of those guys in a bunch of different ways. And if that jump shot comes around for Leonard Miller, oh my goodness, watch out. This guy could be a lot of fun and a really 
really good prospect in the NBA. My sixth guy here in this video is Derek Lively the second from Duke and a player who I just end up falling in love with guys like this. Um, I think another example of a player who I just really liked back in his draft was Isaiah Jackson who was drafted by the Indiana Pacers in the 20s. And maybe that hasn't panned out super well, but again, this isn't my big board. This isn't where I have these guys ranked. It's not like I believe Derek Lively is a top seven or eight prospect, but I do think that he's a lot of fun to watch. And the reason I believe that is just guys with really significant size and length and rim deterrence. It's just so fun for me. I, I, I love block shots. It's one of my favorite thing to watch in the NBA just because of kind of the athletic background you have to have to be blocking some of the other best athletes in the world. I think it's a really underrated kind of tool and, and skill that honestly, like block highlights are some of the craziest sometimes when you see a guy swat the ball out of bounds. And Derek Lively does that. He's a fantastic shot blocker. I kind of think back to some games this year where he had five, six, eight blocks in a game. Those are kind of monstrous performances and not something you're gonna see every single night, obviously, in the NBA. But from an entertainment perspective, and just a guy that I've really enjoyed evaluating, I think it's been Derek Lively because even outside of just the rim protection, I think that there's something in there when it comes to the rim presence he can put on the, the backside of the rim if he's playing right with the right guys. I think Kyle Filipowski this year missed him a decent amount of times on some lob opportunities in their high low sets at Duke. And I also think that uh, with Derek Lively, he's a better passer than I think a lot of people give him credit for. Now it's not like you're gonna run the offense through him. I mean, you're not gonna feed him in a whole bunch of post ups, but I think like in the middle of his zone, can he make the right read decent? Lee? Like, yeah, I think so. And I also believe that with the shooting and the touch coming around a little bit, maybe we see Derek Lively grow into a, a really good player and a player who I think is going to surprise some people. Now I'm hoping, and I'm really hoping that he ends up panning out very well, maybe better than Isaiah Jackson has so far, because I want to see this guy on the NBA court and I want to see him kind of succeed and, and really play into his strengths at the NBA level. My seventh guy, and this is no surprise if you've been watching the channel for a while, it's Brandon Pajemski from the Santa Clara Broncos. And for a while, I've been mocking him as a first round player well before the combine. And before the combine, I actually made a video discussing about some of the players who I thought could be the biggest risers through the NBA draft combine. And Brandon Pajemski was my number one player in that list. And I feel like I'm vindicated in that. He had a fantastic combine for himself. I think impressed a lot of people with his shot making, his feel for the game. And I think his activity level is probably the one thing that stands out a ton when you actually really watch this guy and tune into Santa Clara games because there's a few things that he does differently than a lot of other prospects. One, he works on defense. And what I mean by that is he's very active. He tries to cut off driving lanes as a pinch defender. He also does a, a pretty good job recovering back out to the perimeter. He works really hard on kind of leveraging his frame, even though he's a little bit smaller, he leverages his frame pretty well to kind of work on the inside if he's getting posted up. And I think all in all, he's just a very smart prospect. And then offensively, when you have a player who can shoot the way that Brandon Pajemski does, it just opens up the entire court for you. Of course, a lot of people like to think about, oh, four or five out spacing and you get driving kicks. And yes, that's an element to it. But I think on top of it, you're going to see Brandon Pajemski grow into a really good dribble handoff user, similar to what we've seen from Duncan Robinson and Kevin Herter, who I think have been fantastic in the roles with their teams. Of course, Duncan Robinson, you know, people look at the contract and kind of fixate on that. But Duncan Robinson was hugely important to Miami in their playoff run. And without him, you could argue maybe they get bounced in the first round, which I know sounds crazy, but if you go back and actually run the tape on that, he had a fantastic series against the Milwaukee Bucks, against Brooke Lopez's drop coverage. And then of course, Kevin Herter was just lights out this year playing with Demonis Sabonis. And it's not a surprise that they're playing with two of the best dribble handoff bigs in the league in Bam Adebayo and Demonis Sabonis, that those guys really pop. And I think if Pajemski goes to the right role, his offensive game, is gonna pop as well, because not only does he shoot, but he can also get downhill, make the right read, kick to the corner. I think he's just an all around impressive passer and decision maker and just a player who I have a lot of trust in. I've been mocking him in the first round, I think longer than anybody else, uh, especially on YouTube. I'm a huge believer in his game. I couldn't believe that he didn't get minutes at Illinois because he's a, a hell of a player and a, a player who I'm really excited to watch in the NBA. 
Moving on to my eighth guy, and perhaps one of the most polarizing players in this draft, and it's Amani Bates. And there's a few things I want to highlight about Amani Bates because I know that, oh yes, he's a social media sensation. There's a whole bunch of people who are like, well, you like Amani Bates because this, that, or the other thing. I like Amani Bates for a basketball perspective. I think that realistically, he has some intriguing and portable, like, kind of skills that will work in the NBA as long as he buys into those things. And when you're watching him, this guy's one of the best heat check shooters in the draft. There's no question about that. Some of the shots that he takes and makes are incredible. He's fantastic as a self creator, but I think really the role that he's gonna find himself in the most is as a movement off ball shooter. And I think when you utilize his actual skill set, which is as a set based shooter, when he gets his feet established and his balance kind of rising up vertically in ascension, Amani Bates is a lights out shooter with extremely great range. I think he's a player that is really underrated actually, because yes, he had a terrible freshman season. For some reason, everyone fixated on that when he was playing for Memphis and yes, he fell out of the rotation, but people don't for some reason fixate on Gigi Jackson's terrible freshman season and how South Carolina was also terrible. And yes, he didn't get benched, but it's because South Carolina wasn't trying to win games at the end. They were just kind of going through their season. It's a completely different scenario. And it's not that Imani Bates and it's not that I hate Gigi Jackson necessarily. I just think Imani Bates received so much hate and kind of the perception on him shifted so much. He had a really nice individual season for Eastern Michigan. I know people are gonna say, oh, they didn't win that many games. Yeah, okay, I understand, but Imani Bates, if you're drafting him in the NBA, it's not like he's gonna be the sole factor on whether your team wins or loses. Uh, and if you can get him to adjust to a role, I think he's gonna be great. And I also think that one thing that's really undersold about him is his first step, especially, not necessarily off the live dribble, but out of his triple threat, just his ability to rip through and go. Yes, he's extremely light, that plays into it. But I think he just is gonna be able to blow by guys at a, a much higher rate. And with his shooting capabilities, there's gonna be teams that are worried about him from 25, 30 feet out potentially. And it's gonna open up a lot of space for him to kind of operate. And if you kind of bring along some of his other elements as decision-making and just his overall kind of feel for the game, I think Imani Bates could be a really nice kind of sneaky pickup toward the end of the draft. Then my final guy I wanna talk about, and this one might be a little cheesy, but I couldn't make this video without talking about him. And it's Victor Wembanyama from Metropolitan's 92. And it's not that, you know, everyone knows how good this guy is. And it's not even about that necessarily of like, uh, oh, well, this is my guy because he's so talented, but it kind of is. Like for me, evaluating this draft has been so much fun. Like I, I'm, to be honest, I'm excited for 2024. I hope you are as well. There's gonna be a mock draft out on the channel the day after the 2023 NBA draft. But I'm also kind of disappointed because there's not another Victor Wembanyama in that draft and I think that they, there might not ever be another Victor Wembanyama and I'm just so thankful that I was kind of in the position I've been in um, not only as a YouTuber but as just someone who loves basketball the way that I do and cares about like draft evaluation even if nobody watched I would love making these videos and I would love watching these prospects because it's something I did before I was a YouTuber I wrote 150 page write-ups on these prospects as you know, what I saw in them and what I could expect them to become. And I think I've gotten better at it too, as time's gone on. But for Victor Wembanyama, I'm just so thankful that I've been in a spot where I could witness him as a prospect. I could kind of lock myself into all of the things that he's great at. And I could just really study his game, learn from it and, and just honestly enjoy his film in this draft process. He's been so much fun to talk about. I made a like multiple videos about Victor Wembanyama, which is pretty different from what I typically do about draft prospects. And it's just because I, I have an admiration for how talented he is at his size, at his length. You guys know the, dr the drill on Victor Wembanyama, but it's just, I'm so thankful that I was again in a spot to evaluate this guy um, and actually just get to see him play before the draft. I, I'm just very thankful for that. I was too young to evaluate LeBron. Wish I was there to do that. I was only three years old uh, when he got drafted. So I had the opportunity this time around to actually scout, study Victor Wembanyama, And I feel like I've learned so much from watching him and I just have had so much fun doing it. So I had to include him as my final guy on this list. 
these have been my guys for the 2023 NBA draft. Remember, this is not a big board. This is not my ranking on who's going to be where and how great they all are. This is just players I enjoy watching. Now, I think that there's all redeeming qualities about them. And I think they're all good in their own ways. And I think if they find the right situations, they're all going to be successful in some capacity or another. But I just, you know, these are players I've just had so much fun watching this year. And I, I've really enjoyed it. I would love to hear your guys's guys down in the comment section below so make sure to comment them down below uh, and just for a quick recap here as well my guys were Amon Thompson, Taylor Hendricks, Anthony Black, Trace Jackson Davis, Leonard Miller, Derek Lively, Brandon Pajemski, Imani Bates and of course the number one overall pick Victor Wembanyama. Thanks again so much for watching guys make sure to stay tuned for that other content coming out this week both the NBA draft big board my final NBA mock draft and a lot of other great content as well that I'm really excited about. Leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more, and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.